Good morning, and welcome to Refuge Online, everyone. Happy Resurrection Sunday. This morning, we'll be getting into a time of worship and then a special message from Pastor Raul for this Sunday morning's Easter service. So please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, Lord, that we get to spend with our families and in your presence, Lord, that we get to worship you and honor you and praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is stronger and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the old a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King.
yes, I say for all that you've done for me. Oh, 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 oh. All of who you are reaches the darkest parts. Lifting the weight and the race and the scars, I had to hold on me. Here I am, bearing on, tearing down every wall. So amazed by your grace and the way you're still holding me. Oh, 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 oh my God, you are the answer. His own life on the cross, reaching out to us. Yeah. Oh, 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 my God, you are the unchanging love. My God, your heart sends hope from above. Great creator, beautiful Savior, I've been. Let all the world know Jesus 
face For last Every debt has been repaid Broken hearts can be remade Jesus saves Seen above the storms of life Seen through the darkest nights Jesus saves Free at last Free at last what a joyful noise we'll make As we join in heaven's song To let all the world know Jesus saves Raise the shouts To let all the world know Jesus saves We'll sing it out To let all the world know Jesus saves For we'll raise the shouts To let all the world know you say you heal, you say you heal, we're so real, the Father's heart to us. Cause you rose and raised us from the grave, the Spirit lives in us. Sing it out, to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Or raise a shout, to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Or sing it out. Let all the world know that Jesus saves. Raise a shout. Let all the world know that Jesus saves. Sing it out. Sing it out. Let all the world know that Jesus saves. Raise a shout. Let all the world know that Jesus saves. Sing it out. Let all the world know. God bless you guys. Please welcome Pastor Rawl. He has risen. What an amazing day. What a great day of joy. A day of celebrating our risen Lord Jesus Christ and his victory that he had over sin on the cross and over the grave as he resurrected from the grave on the third day. Now, here we are this morning celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Resurrection Sunday, the day upon which our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the grave, alive and well. We have come to sing his praises, celebrate his resurrection, and worship our King who conquered the grave. How glorious this day is. And I'm excited to be here this morning and um, just celebrate it with you. And we're, so wherever you are, uh, I, I hope that you would just enjoy this day because it's filled with hope. It reminds us of the victory that Jesus Christ had over the grave. And, uh, and he, is, he is alive. He is risen. And so welcome to Refuge Bible Fellowship. Uh, today is Sunday, April 12th, and we are celebrating the risen Christ. And uh, so this morning's message is titled, The Wonder of His Resurrection. The Wonder of His Resurrection. Uh, so we're celebrating today the conquering of the grave by our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have come to sing his praises and worship our King uh, who conquered the grave. And it is truly a glorious, oh, what a day. Truly, this day is like no other, no other. Uh, we're, we're here to acknowledge and celebrate an empty tomb and a risen Savior who, who conquered sin and death. But here's one thing that we need to also acknowledge, because this Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, is like no other Sunday that we've ever experienced, at least not in my lifetime. We, uh, in our day today, are experiencing this pandemic, COVID-19, a worldwide epidemic, and it's impacted the lives of millions, in fact, billions of people uh, around the globe, and it's changed our lives in drastic ways. A common term that we've come to know is social distancing. Well, we've come to wear masks wherever we go. Uh, we 
go to the grocery store and we stand in lines, uh, Walmart, Target, uh, Home Depot, we're, we're standing in lines and they're, they're in some places they're only letting a certain amount of people go into the store and then uh, as people come out, more are able to go in. Uh, some people are working from home where they hadn't before and uh, many others have lost their jobs. But something that we need to understand is that God has not abandoned us. He has not forsaken us. He has not turned his back on us. He is here. He is faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we, look, we can look to him. We can trust in him and count on him. When we're used to connecting with God in a specific way, the drastic disruption in that routine, can really be shocking to our relationship with the Lord. If we're used to uh, worshiping God in a certain way, it can be shocking to our relationship with Him. We may not say it, but some people have felt as if the absence of the corporate church is actually, in a way, it feels like an absence of God. And that's not true. He's not absent He's not absent today, he wasn't absent yesterday, and he won't be absent tomorrow. He's with us. He hasn't left us, he hasn't turned his back on us. He is with us. Circumstances, we need to understand, do not have an effect on him. But they do have an effect on us. I believe that the church right now is being assisted, uh, things are being revealed personally and corporately, uh, it, across all the churches, the, the local churches throughout the world, especially, I believe, here in the United States. Because I think that, and I believe, I truly believe this, that the Lord is purifying, strengthening. He's sifting the church, and he's doing a work in our lives individually so powerfully through this time of... Uh, uh, being quarantined to our homes and living lives in just a different way. And, and remember this, this has only gone on for a few weeks. It's a very short period of time. You know what's been disrupted is our comfort. That's what's been disrupted. And it's forced us to really, uh, really think about our relationship with Jesus Christ. It helps things uh, be put in their proper perspective. Maybe the church needed a different Easter. Maybe we're supposed to reflect more on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ without anything other than our Bible and our families, stripped of everything but the thought and awareness of an empty tomb. Maybe what we're being stripped of in corporate worship is revealing what we're in desperate need of in our personal worship. Personal devotion and studying of God's word in constant prayer and in sharing the gospel with others. You know, if you were so reliant on the church having scheduled worship services for you to connect with other people, perhaps this is stretching you a bit and forcing you to be intentional and deliberate and really testing how much you truly desire to fellowship with other believers and are submitted and given to being followers of Jesus Christ, to do the work of an evangelist personally in the sphere of influence that God has entrusted to you. It's testing all of us. It's stretching all of us. We need to remember that the church has never saved anyone. Faith alone in Jesus alone does. And church serves as a fellowship of believers that come together to worship, pray, and be discipled in Christ and live for God's glory. And in this way, we fellowship to stir each other up to love and good works. Just because we're apart physically doesn't mean that we don't have the means to do this. We have media. We have these phones that we can connect with people in an instant. And so we need to take full advantage of that. What you're doing now matters. How you respond in this time of trial really does matter. 
Just because we're in our homes this Easter doesn't mean that the gospel has been hindered. That's something that we need to understand. In fact, right now you're watching, you're listening to this service online. And so the gospel has not been hindered. The church is not in trouble. Uh, Jesus is the foundation. Upon him the church is built. And he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Paul said that although he was in chains, the gospel was not In fact, when he was in jail, when he was imprisoned, he was still writing letters and sending them out. What form of communication are you using to get the gospel out? Right now, I would encourage you, if you're watching this on Facebook, you can hit share on the bottom of your screen. You can start your own watch party and invite many people to watch this service in the comfort of their own homes. Perhaps they'll listen to the gospel for the first time. And you are the one that has put this before them and gave them and given them an opportunity to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ on this Easter Sunday. So cheer up. <laughs> cheer up. God is still on the throne. Jesus is risen. Our celebration has not been canceled. And we have everything to gain in Christ Still, even now. He is risen and we're about to be reminded of what took place on the Sunday morning after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So grab your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 24. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pray for our time together in his word. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the love that you have shown to us by sending your son to this earth to die on the cross, to pay for our sins in full. I pray that you would bless our time together, that you would open up our minds to understand and see what the scriptures are telling us in regards to the Savior whom you sent to pay for our sins on the cross and also to justify us by his rising from the grave. And so, Lord, I ask your blessing upon upon our time together. May you encourage us by your word. May you remind us of your love. And may you fill us with your hope as we place our trust once again in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father, and we commit this time into your hands, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to explore... uh, the things that the disciples were thinking and saying between the time of Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection, and then compare this with the time he appeared to them and see that he was indeed resurrected. This is what I want to explore. That way we understand what they were thinking from the time of his crucifixion, but also the time after his resurrection and the things that they did, what they thought and why they thought those things. So what were the disciples thinking? These are questions that we're going to be answering this morning. What were the disciples thinking and feeling prior to Jesus' resurrection? Why were they feeling this way? According to all four Gospels, on Sunday before the sun came up, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of uh, of, uh, James and Joanna, uh, they came to the garden tomb and they found the tomb empty. The news went out immediately. The disciples were told that the tomb was empty. And we know there were a variety of responses from them when they heard the news that Jesus was not there. But before we get there, let's begin with the burial of Jesus Christ. Uh, The burial of Jesus Christ is recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew 27, if you're writing down some notes, you can jot this down. Matthew 27, 57 through 61. Mark 15, 42 through 47, and Luke chapter 23, verses 50 through 56, and finally John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42. According to all four Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea asked for the body of Jesus from Pilate, and Pilate gave it to him. He turned it over to him. Joseph and Nicodemus prepared the body of Jesus as best as they could, wrapping it in linen and preparing him with spices about 75 pounds worth of spices. And so what they did after they prepared Jesus' body, they put his body into the tomb, in the garden tomb, and they rolled this 
enormous stone in front of it. That way it would seal the entrance. The stone was normally run on a groove and it would take several strong men to move it. Uh, This was done as Mary Magdalene and the mother of James and the mother of James sat and watched the stone being rolled into place. And I, I remember last year as Uh, My wife and I, we had gone to Israel and we went to the garden tomb. And where the garden tomb is, not too far from Golgotha, the place of the school where Jesus was crucified, um, there there is a a hill. So the garden tomb is across this little hill and and it comes down and there's a rise of about eight feet on the other side. And in a very natural place where Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James... And Joanna could sit there, anyone could sit there and watch clearly as Joseph and Nicodemus prepared the body and put Jesus into the tomb and rolled the stone in front of the entrance. So this all happened on Friday, Jesus' crucifixion and his burial. Let's move on to Saturday. The chief priests and the Pharisees wanted to make sure no one stole Jesus' body, only to continue uh, what they believed to be a lie. And because Jesus, they knew that Jesus said that he would resurrect from the grave in three days. Well, they wanted to make sure that no one stole the body uh, and, uh, and, and then, you know, continued on with this, what they considered to be a lie, and said that Jesus had risen from the grave. One of the things that we need to understand also is that if this is what they were afraid of, then all they would need to ask is, you know, who's seen Jesus alive? And from what we've come to understand and know in the scriptures is that hundreds of people saw Jesus resurrected. He was alive and well after his crucifixion. Now, they wanted to make sure that nobody... Uh, stole the body of Jesus, and they wanted to make sure nobody moved it, and so they had this done. How how would the disciples be able to tell everyone that Jesus had risen without proof of a live person? And that's a question we need to ask ourselves. So they went to Pilate and asked that the tomb be sealed, and to have a guard of soldiers posted at the tomb so as to ensure that no one stole Jesus' body. And so Pilate agreed and gave them soldiers to use for this purpose. And this is recorded in Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 66. There is no way the disciples could come to defeat the Roman guard, let alone roll away this stone and steal Jesus' body. There's no way, because if that were to happen, these Roman guards would be put to death, and the Roman guards wouldn't allow that as well. Now, the same two women who had seen where Jesus had been laid on Friday, <coughs> excuse me, were back on Sunday to finish the embalming of Jesus, and uh, instead uh, they found that um, Jesus wasn't there. And, and this, is, this is what we see, and we come to know through all four Gospels, that when they came back to finish the preparation of Jesus' body for burial. They were amazed. They were puzzled. They were baffled. They were filled with wonder. This is how they're described, their encounter, this, this whole event that took place. And they were filled with fear, and they were alarmed. So in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 5, Luke writes this, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Let's stop there. So they they were filled with fear. They were amazed. Puzzled, baffled, they were filled with wonder, and they were alarmed. So why did they respond this way? Well, because they came to the tomb. And listen, this is what what they were thinking as they were coming to the tomb. Otherwise, they wouldn't be puzzled, baffled, alarmed, filled with awe and wonder and amazement. They were coming to the tomb expecting to find the body of Jesus laying there. They didn't know who was going to 
roll the stone away, but that was a, a problem that they would deal with when they got there. But when they got there, they found out that Jesus wasn't there. And they were confronted by an angel of the Lord that had descended from heaven, had rolled the stone away from the entrance of the tomb to show that Jesus was not there. The woman didn't see Jesus come out of the tomb because he was already out of the tomb. You see, the angel didn't roll the stone away from the mouth of this tomb uh, to let Jesus out. He was already out. He rolled, they, he, that angel rolled it away from the entrance of the tomb so that they would all see that he was not there. He had risen. And then as we continue in Luke chapter uh, 24, verse 5, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Again, they were expecting to find uh, the body of Jesus. They didn't find that. But they were reminded instead, as they saw an empty tomb, by this angel of Jesus' words, that he would rise on the third day after his burial. So, of course, at this point, having an empty tomb, having the words be brought back to them as far as what Jesus had prophesied in regards to his own death, burial, and then resurrection... They were filled with wonder. They, they were thinking, could, could this be? Could it be possible? From there, as we know how it is that uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and, and how it is that they responded to this, immediately at this point they went and told the disciples. So we, we get to see also how it is that the disciples responded to the news of the empty tomb. In verse 8, again, we're going to overlap as we go in through the other verses. It says, And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now, when Peter looked in, they weren't the, the linen cloths weren't just laying there; they were they were folded. They were folded. So it was as if someone had gone in, unwrapped, and placed the linen cloths there in the tomb. Well, when Mary Magdalene, Mary and the mother, Mary the mother of James and Joanna came to the disciples and told them what had happened, uh, they thought that the women were, were making this up. This was a, a story that they were, it was just wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. You know, how could this be? How could it be that the tomb was empty? And so Peter and John, and we know that, that they thought that they were making this up, and so we have Peter and John who ran to the tomb uh, now, John records it this way, that basically he was a faster runner, or he got there quicker than Peter, and he got to the tomb, but he didn't enter into it. But Peter, as soon as he got there, he went straight into the tomb. Well, they found it just as the women had told them, empty. We know according to John 20, chapter, two, uh, chapter 20, verse 2, that when the women told the disciples, they also said, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So by, by this, uh, John 22, verse 2, that they too, even at that point, even after having been told by the angel that this was a fulfilled prophecy, that which was foretold to them by Jesus of his own death, burial, and resurrection, they too, even at that point, they said, we don't know where they've taken him, but the tomb is empty. It's interesting that we can come to read, we can come to know and understand and yet not believe. 
And so I pray that, that throughout this, this message, this brief time that we're spending together in the scriptures, on this Easter Sunday that we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you would not only come to have read and understand and know the scriptures, but that you too would come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who was sent by the Father to die for you. And through belief in him and repentance, just giving your life to him, that you will know salvation and eternal life, the forgiveness of your sins. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, these women, they responded in that way. The disciples responded in that way. Keep in mind that the apostles were the ones that were told also at this time by Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joanna and the other women. And so these were men 11 men who had spent three years of their lives at, you could say, at Jesus' feet, learning from him. And still, they were filled with doubt and unbelief. Well, there's this story of these disciples on the road to Emmaus as we continue in Luke chapter 24. Verse 13 says, That very day, Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were walking, or they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? They stood still, looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. Uh, they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Jesus, with the two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem. Just a seven-mile walk. And through this story, we get a better understanding of what the apostles and other disciples were thinking when they received the word of Jesus' empty tomb, as we read in the previous verses, verses 13 through 24. Really, what was their hope in Christ? Well, that's revealed in verse 21. As they said, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But their hope was gone as they, as they continued saying, yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. In other words, it's, it's been three days since Jesus has been crucified. Our hope is dead along with Jesus. They were hoping that Jesus, you see, would be the one to deliver them from Roman oppression to relieve them from their earthly troubles. My friends, Jesus never promised this. He said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Do not lose heart. You, you, be courageous. Know that our hope is steadfast in Jesus Christ. It's immovable in him. In this world we will experience just troubles, tribulation, trials. James 1, 2 through 4, James writes in, in those verses, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, you learn to be content in Christ. As you nurture, as you build on that relationship, that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which originates with salvation, it's founded upon Jesus Christ. 
from there, we continue to mature and we're able to discern the circumstances that we're faced with, the trials that we go through, the troubles that are at hand. And, and we, we go through those trials in such a way that it reflects a wisdom that can only be given to us through the word of God and it brings glory to God. He doesn't promise to relieve us of our earthly troubles. You know, even through this COVID pandemic, you know, all of, of course, all of us, all of us, there's not one of us that says, oh, I, I wish this would continue on through the rest of the year. You know, there's no one who is happy about this pandemic. And every single one of us wants for all of this to stop. But I think that we are really not understanding that we don't have an answer for exactly why God has allowed this to happen. But what we can do and what we should do is ask the Lord what he desires of us through this time. How are we to respond, reflecting our relationship with him, our hope in him, uh, this is a time when more people are open to the gospel. They, they want to just know hope. They, they want to know their purpose in the, this life. And you have the answer. You have the message of reconciliation. And so, Christian, don't waste this time complaining about things. Of course, use wisdom. But what I'm encouraging you to do is take advantage of this time in a good way and bring hope to people around you. Bring the news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, again, he didn't promise to relieve them of their earthly troubles. That's what they were looking for in this verse. In verse 21, they revealed, they revealed their hearts, and yet he's been dead. He's been dead for three days. Because this didn't happen, they were sad. They, they felt let down. But it was because they still didn't understand that Jesus came to deliver them from something much bigger and better than civil oppression. He had come to deliver them from eternal condemnation and the grave through his sacrifice and his resurrection. And so it is with us. You see, God isn't a genie that just makes life perfect for us. And God has sent his son so that we would be perfected in him. And we would be made right before the Father. For Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then after they revealed their hearts, Jesus explains himself according to the scriptures. Continuing on in verse 25, and he said to them, this is Jesus speaking now to the two disciples that were walking on the road to Emmaus. Verse 25 he said, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose at same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven. And those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them, uh, he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So Jesus explained the scriptures. Jesus took the time to have fellowship with them personally. And their eyes were open to see and they recognized Jesus for who he was, knowing that he had indeed risen from the grave and he was alive. So what did they do? 
What was their response in that very moment? When their eyes were open, when they realized that that was truly Jesus who was before them, it was truly Jesus who had walked with them, and their hearts burned as he opened up the scriptures and interpreted them, helping them realize that it was all revealing Jesus Christ. Well, after they realized this, immediately, it says here, that same hour, Remember, they had just traveled seven miles to this village. And at that very moment, they were so excited that they went back seven miles to Jerusalem to tell all the others the good news. Everything that had taken place. Well, it was time for Jesus to show himself to all of them, though. Even as they came back, they traveled seven miles. Remember that Jesus at that point had, had vanished, had, had disappeared had left their presence. And yet they saw how it was that he took bread. He, he was, you could say, eating with them at table. <clears throat> and yet he disappeared in a moment. Well, they traveled seven miles back to Jerusalem, and it was time for Jesus to show himself to all of them. And while these two disciples were explaining to the apostles and to the other disciples, what had taken place on the road to Emmaus, Jesus shows up. Peace be to you. They were all shocked. They were all alarmed and filled with fear. And Jesus asked them why they were distressed and so anxious, why it was that they doubted. Then Jesus showed showed them his hands and he showed them his his feet, and he encouraged them, touch me. Uh, A spirit does not have a body, is what he was telling them. Even then they disbelieved, filled with a mixture of joy and amazement, wonder and awe. This whole situation, I mean, if you were there, I'm sure you and I would have responded the same way. Jesus simply appearing. And then they were encouraged to touch him. They saw the wounds in his hands, the wounds in his feet. Verse 36 brings us through this whole situation. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do, you doubt, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said these, this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate before them. It's right in front of their eyes. (laughs) They thought they saw a spirit, yet he was proven. He was proving that he had risen from the grave. They could touch his body. They could see where the nails had gone in to his hands and into his feet. Even though Jesus had told them over and over, that he would die and resurrect on the third day, they were still in awe and filled with wonder when it did happen. It was just, it seemed to be just beyond their belief. And he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. So he showed himself to them. He demonstrated that he was resurrected from the grave and it was him encouraging them to touch his body. But then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. Verse 44 says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus referred to his words that he had spoken to them. Jesus referred to scripture that they knew, the law of Moses, the prophets, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms. 
And Jesus points out that they match. His life and scripture match up. And that what is written and what he spoke were the prophecy and the fulfillment in him. One of the things that we need to have an answer for is why read the Bible? The answer to that is to know and believe that Jesus is the Christ. Why is believing in Christ important? Because by believing, you will have and come to know eternal life. You see, there was an apostle that had difficulty believing, and his name was Thomas. In John chapter 20, has the account of of this event, uh, an exchange between Jesus and Thomas. This is after the resurrection. In verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. One day the wonder of his resurrection will be known by you. Perhaps it has passed. Perhaps today is that day. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. So I would hope that today be the day of salvation for you. That today you are filled with the wonder of his resurrection and you know salvation in him. You know it's fullness when you come into a full understanding and belief of his resurrection and that salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. At that point, you will know eternal forgiveness, complete forgiveness of your sins. The burdens of your sins will be withdrawn from you. And you will be given eternal life because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Verses 30 and 31 says this. And and here's the, the why of reading the Bible. Especially as we see the Gospel of John. In John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And I pray pray that today you are filled with that wonder of Jesus' resurrection and have come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for your sins, rose from the grave three three days later, and according to scriptures, Not only did he rise from the grave, but 40 days later ascended to the right hand of the Father. There are those who believe, but are without full understanding. There are those who receive the news with gladness. And there are still others who doubt. But I pray that they, like Thomas, come to believe and are filled with the awe of God's grace through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. There are others still who have denied Jesus and are in need of being restored. Perhaps you're there, you're here this morning and and you're you're watching this message and you're listening and, and you understand just how much God loves you. And you at one point had a good relationship with Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're the one who would be regarded as the prodigal son, the one who had who has strayed from the Lord, who's turned your back upon the, the Lord. Uh, I was once that prodigal son. I remember there, there was a number of years that I t- had turned my back upon my Lord and Savior. And there was a moment when I was reminded of his goodness, of his grace, of his forgiveness. And I understood and I realized that the things that 
I was doing, the, the life that I was leading was not bringing him glory. It was not a proper response to the love that he first demonstrated to me. And I remember that moment when I gave my life to the Lord once more. I had made a recommitment to the Lord and I surrendered my life to him once more. And from that day this way, I haven't looked back and I have never regretted that decision. And so I hope for you, if you're, you're in that place to where you're that prodigal son, I pray that this is the moment to where you recommit your life to Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's, he said that in John 10.10. 10. Jesus was victorious over sin and he conquered the grave so that you could be saved from the condemnation of sin by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Remember God's word, realize its fulfillment, and then I pray you come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, according to John 20, 31. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Jesus is risen. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then Romans 10, 9 and 13 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. John eleven twenty five 25 through 27 says this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And this was Jesus' question to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. I pray that today, on this Sunday, at this very moment, that you are filled with the wonder of Jesus' resurrection and your response is one that draws you unto him. Perhaps closer if you, if you already have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have not known salvation in him, if you have not been born again of the Spirit, that this is a moment when you're drawn to him by the wonder of his resurrection and have come to believe that he is a son of God who was sent to this earth to die for your sins. And he rose again on the third day. May today be the day of salvation. I pray that you would simply cry out to the Lord, asking him for forgiveness and asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And I promise you that if you do it with sincerity, he will change your heart. He will give you new desires and he'll, he'll give you the hope of heaven, the hope of his glory. And life changes for eternity. From this moment on, you will be filled with hope. I pray that's you, you being filled with that wonder of his resurrection. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonder of your resurrection. For the wonder of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that today we would meditate on the gospel. We would think about this day that we acknowledge that that we observe as the day in which Jesus Christ rose from the grave. I pray that we would be ones who would respond well. That we would be filled with joy and with hope and with a zeal and desire to spread the gospel, to tell as many people as we can about the good news of Jesus Christ and that anyone can know salvation in him. For God wishes that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. I pray, Lord, that even in this day, many people who are watching and listening to this surrender their lives to you and know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, for this day. 
And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. He is risen. God bless you.